Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alice. I'm the research lead at Quamar Cap. And today with me is Tom Duff Golden. He is the VP of International Policies at Coinbase. Uh, Tom, would you like to uh, do a self intro? Yeah, happy to. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm like sitting in the mouth of the, of the wolf here. Um, so I'm Tom Duff Gordon. I'm the VP of International Policy at Coinbase. So that means um, I have the kind of the fortune to deal with all the regulators, governments, central banks outside of the US. So I'm based here in London, but I spend a lot of time traveling because we're covering UK, but also covering Europe, Middle East, uh, Asia, Canada, and, and the Americas. So uh, I've been at Coinbase for nearly two years now. Before that, I was in traditional finance. Uh, I was 15 years at Credit Suisse. So good timing, I think, to leave Credit Suisse and having a, a great time at, uh, at Coinbase. Excellent. Um, regulation is a very important topic for us in the industry, especially now. Uh, so today, I have a, a, my main goal here is to see the global chessboard of uh, international rules and regulations. And I want to understand that a bit more and see how has that impacted Coinbase strategy uh, this year thus far. So to start with, congratulations on the achievement in Singapore and Spain. Would you like to give us some details on that? Yeah, happy to. We were um, yeah, super excited over the last um, month or so. Some of you may have seen, we actually had Bermuda as well. So we had um, a registration announced in Spain that we're really pleased about. We got our full license in Singapore uh, and we've got a second license entity in kind of Bermuda. So uh, I'm on kind of very much Team International at Coinbase. We, we want to bring a billion people into crypto. We're all about economic freedom. Uh, and so scaling internationally is, is kind of getting more and more important for us. Uh, particularly given where the kind of the US is. Um, but if I just think about Spain just quickly for one second, I'm sure a lot of you are, are focused or know about the regulation there that went live and was, was passed earlier this year, the markets in crypto assets regulation. That kind of enters into kind of into forced implementation, not until 2025 for CASPs. So in the meantime, it's important to get registrations in all the big different markets. We have that in Germany, we have it in Ireland and the Netherlands and a bunch of places. So we were pleased to get over the line uh, in Spain. Um, when we look at Singapore, we see that as a key hub market. Um, the MAS, which is the regulator there, uh, and the central bank, they're just extremely progressive uh, and on the front foot when it comes to crypto. You can have some of the most detailed conversations that I have with any regulators around the world with the MAS. So we think you know, that Southeast Asia region, there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot going on, uh, and for us to be fully licensed in, in Singapore is, is great. But I think more generally we have this philosophy for our kind of expansion, which is go deep and it's go broad. So we have about 10 markets where we want to go deep uh, outside of the US. And these are, you know, we've got um, uh, Brazil and we've got Canada and the Americas. We've got the UK, which is actually our number one international market. We've got five markets in, in the EU. So we have, uh, we've got Germany, we've got Ireland, we've got Spain, we've got Italy and France. And then on the Asia side, it's Singapore, where we just had the license I mentioned, and it's Australia. So, so we are fighting the good fight in the US, but the international expansion of Coinbase is, is a big deal, and that's what I'm kind of focused on. Yeah, very happy to hear that, because a lot of the effort that the team has spent getting all these licenses, and also a, the global expansion strategy, I think that's going to benefit uh, the whole industry as well, just to get more interaction with the regulators. Um, also, uh, I want to ask about the G20 updates because in September, uh, G20 moves forward with international crypto framework. Uh, I was wondering if there's any jurisdictional update uh, for crypto regulations coming out of it. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, I think it went largely unnoticed. Um, back in, in September, we had India, which is running the G20. Uh, and obviously post FTX, kind of regulating crypto has been a big topic. Uh, and there was a kind of a question mark, right? Uh, and the question mark was, should we regulate crypto or should we ban it? Uh, and actually, there are a number of very large members of, of the G20 that for some time thought, hey, if we're worried about dollarization, if we're worried about capital controls, maybe the thing to do is actually to ban this rather than regulate it. Um, and so a number of us, and, and I was pretty engaged with this, spent a lot of time with some of those big G20 members trying to force them into the mindset of, Actually, we need just basic global guardrails for this industry, uh, because if we try and ban it, it, it ain't going to work. You can't turn off the internet. People are just going to use it, and they're going to be kind of less protected. So, you know, I feel like we were somewhat complacent, maybe as an industry, because there was a moment where I genuinely think it could have gone in a different direction. But I'm delighted to say we got that agreement. Uh, we've got the 10 principles from the FSB. We've got a bunch of things coming out of IOSCO, IMF, and some of these other bodies. And that for us at Coinbase as a kind of a global institution is so important because we've now got 
a kind of a consensus that we should regulate it and we should focus on the kind of the centralized kind of axes, you know, like Coinbase, you know, to kick off with. So that is not going to immediately translate into the same regulation everywhere. Uh, but what it does do is it makes sure everybody's on the journey. Um, and when I think of that journey towards regulation, it has kind of three stages. You've got, you know, AML, which kind of comes first. After AML, you then have kind of custody and licensing regimes. And then after that, you have implementation. And I guess the next step outside is DeFi. What do you do about that? Decentralized ID, et cetera. Now across the G20, we think uh, about 83% of the G20 plus financial centers are all now getting advanced on that agenda. I mean, outside of China and outside of the US, which we can talk about, um, almost everybody else is, is kind of step one or step two or step three. Uh, and that for us at Coinbase is really exciting because we're going to see you know, more adoption, more legitimacy, more trust as these rules kind of get bed in. And I think you know, the focus rightly is on the part of the, the industry where effectively we've got the fiat on ramps uh, where we're doing some of the KYC and other stuff. And we're going to allow hopefully the innovation in DeFi and in some of those other projects to take place before regulation subsequently catches up. Yeah, that's a very clear roadmap you just laid out for us there. I appreciate that in the audience uh, base today, we have a lot of NFT, GameFi, uh, Ethereum audience here. So later on, we can touch upon some of the other use cases. But since now we are all here today in London, I want to ask about the UK policies. So where are we on the, on the uh, roadmap of uh, regulation right now? So I would kind of split the UK into two halves, right? I think you've got the government, you've got the regulators. I think um, the government have been great. Uh, I think from the prime minister down, uh, there's a real acceptance of the power of this technology. The prime minister, I think, spent some time on the West Coast. I think he understands blockchain. I think he understands crypto. And he announced that he wants the UK. I mean, I'm telling you something you will know. He announced that he wants the UK to be a Web3 hub. Um, some of us were doing some stuff earlier this week at the party conference where there's some kind of reports coming out. Uh, and effectively, the chance of the exchequer, he doubled down. I don't know whether you saw it. He said he wants the UK to be a kind of a leader in industries of the future um, and the next kind of Silicon Valley. So I think what's exciting for us and for this industry is to situate this technology within that kind of broader ambition that the UK government has now around technology, which I think is, is, is shared across, uh, across the aisle in Westminster. So there's very good leadership. I think it provides a clear signal. And we've seen a number of companies um, leave the US or get pushed out of the US and start opening offices you know, here in London. So some of you may have also seen the announcement from A16Z. They're an investor in us. They're a big investor in, in this space. Um, and they're launching their first ever office outside the US in London, partly because I think you know, there are these strong, positive, welcoming signals from the government, which is not what we're seeing on the US side. So there's a real opportunity, uh, I think. Um, I think you know, look, when it comes to regulation, we still haven't seen it yet. I think the Treasury are doing a good job. Uh, we know that the FCA is going to come out with some detailed rules and guidance. We've got stablecoin things coming out of the Bank of England. So let's hope that the government vision to really support and propel the sector can be matched with a kind of a balanced approach to regulation that allows the innovation, but, but obviously deals with the investor protection concerns, market integrity, and, and financial stability. So I think a really promising place for us to be right now, and we've just got to you know, together, I think, uh, keep demonstrating the utility of, of this industry such that we can get that balanced regulation. I will just give one shout out for um, a report that we, uh, we peer reviewed, which came out earlier this week from Policy Exchange, which is a big think tank in the UK. Uh, and effectively, what they tried to do was to situate kind of Web3 within that broader kind of tech agenda, use cases, not just in financial services, but outside. And I think the more that we can, you know, demonstrate the utility, demonstrate that there's a consumptive use case for these tokens, uh, as well as the speculative one. It's just gonna pave the way for us, I think, to, um, to kind of land this and grow the industry. Yeah, definitely. And uh, really, like insights like this, like the policy exchange report, is very beneficial, I think, for, for the rest of the industry to see. Uh, also, I know that the financial promotion rules uh, for crypto assets is a big thing in the UK. So one, I'm just curious to know, are you guys uh, FinPro ready? Yeah, I'm tempted to get a show of hands on, on this one to see how everyone's feeling about FinProm, uh, but, but I won't. Um, yeah, so look, fi financial promotion. So this is the regime that goes live, I think, on Monday. Uh, I think some of us can kind of nod if that's the case. Yeah, so it goes live on Monday. Some of it's delayed for a few months. This is very much the first step for the FCA. They have consumer duty, they have the AML rules, they have financial promotions, and then they'll kind of start writing detailed rules kind of going forward. 
Look, the question really is, is what is a financial promotion? Is it every single product and service in the space that you offer? Or is it just the things that you promote? I think right now we're taking quite an expansive definition of what financial promotions is. And I think because of that, you're seeing in the industry a number of players grateful for the extra time to kind of get ready for it. I think we're ready, um, but it's definitely going to be an adjustment for, for people. So uh, watch this space. I think going live on, going live on Monday, uh, financial promotions. No one can disagree and argue with the fact we need to have fair and not misleading promotions. So I don't think anybody litigates that. The question as ever is how much of your website, how much of your app is this going to apply to? So um, this is a big deal. Um, and, you know, I think it comes from the right place, but let's just make sure that it's balanced in terms of the scope. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, uh, some of those impacts would be, for example, the advertisements that I'm seeing on the tube and how that's going to uh, go forward. Uh, okay, so that's UK. What about the US? There are so many things on regulation in the US. Will Coinbase stay and fight in the US market? Will you go more inter international expansion as a strategy? What's the plan? Yeah, so um, yes, there's a lot we could say. We could do a whole session on, on the US, so I'll try and kind of keep it brief. Um, look, we feel that we have a responsibility, uh, particularly in the US, because we're a US headquartered firm, to kind of fight for that regulatory clarity. So in a perfect world would have a kind of common and exchange process with the regulator that's normally what happens it's what happened in europe it's what happens in singapore it's what's happening here in the uk that's not what's happening right on the us because there's a there's a perception from the sec that these tokens already exist within existing kind of securities law um, our strongly held belief is that you know the tokens are not securities they're actually commodities and what's different over there versus here is that over there you've got two different agencies, right? One, the CFTC, which runs the derivatives market, futures market, and commodities, and then you've got the SEC. And there is a turf battle going on between, between the two. Um, so we are, we're determined to try and drive uh, kind of red clarity. Obviously, we have a suit. We don't want to be in a position where we're suing our regulator. That is not where we want to be, but we will do whatever we have to do, right, in order to get um, clarity for this industry. So. The team that I'm in is working very hard in Washington, uh, and we're trying to push some of these kind of congressional, um, some of the congressional things that you're seeing. So we have bipartisan support for two bills, right, that have already been voted out of the um, out of committee in the U.S., which kind of shows that the lawmakers understand that we need clarity. And in actual fact, you can't just shoehorn this industry into existing rules. So that process will take some time. Obviously, there was a snafu just recently around the speaker, which is going to slow things down. There's also an election next year. But whether we go through the regulator or whether we go through Congress or whether we go through the courts, like we are committed to staying in the US, doing everything we possibly can to, to drive this agenda. So you'll see tons of things that we're doing. We just uh, we did a massive stand with crypto day, which some of you may have seen splashed across I saw it uh, on Twitter, it's on Twitter yes. which was big, which was really big. Um, so shout out to my colleagues in Washington for doing that. Um, but we, you know, look, we want to work with everybody because we think the US is a really important market. Uh, we need to get that red clarity. It may not come tomorrow, but I think we are on, the, we are on a good path uh, to kind of getting there. But, but look, we couldn't, you know, there's only 300 odd million people in the US. Our kind of Brian Armstrong's big vision, I think, as you all know, is to bring a billion people into crypto. It's about economic freedom. We can't just do that in the US anyway. Yeah. So, you know, we, we are now adopting this kind of international first mentality. So we're driving our go deep, go broad strategy. And I think you'll see some interesting stuff, you know, from us. Uh, we're shipping a lot at the moment, but there'll be some more things coming before the end of the year. And we're going to be growing in particular the international exchange and making more products available to more people. Um, so the go broad strategy, I think, is going to move fast ahead, but we're, we're confident over time that we will get there in the, in the US. Definitely. Um, that naturally leads me on to asking, so how is this space evolving and adapting, and how can Coinbase uh, plan to navigate it, I think, in this strategy? Yeah, look, I think you're all, you're all seeing it, right? So the regulation, I think, is happening. So post, what regulators do is they solve for the past crisis, and uh, that's what they do in TradFi. It's now what they're doing post-FTX in, in our world. So I think we're going to have a busy, unavoidably a busy two, three years, right, of, of kind of regulation. Um, now that we've got these G20 global principles, they've got to trickle down in, in everywhere. We've got to sort out the US. So there's no question in my mind that it's going to get harder going, tougher going, right, more compliance and, and things like that. But we overall think that regulation, if it's focused on the centralized actors, is a good thing, right? Because I think this will weed out 
some of the bad actors in the space. I think it'll make people more confident in terms of wanting to engage, so we'll drive up adoption. Um, so I think regulation is definitely kind of a, a theme. It's going to get harder. The other one that is really important is use cases. So wherever I am in the world talking to policymakers or regulators, they just say, look, help us with use cases, right? So we kind of get the payments piece. We understand the remittance thing. DeFi is a little harder conceptually, but unback crypto, like what is the, what's the utility? What stands behind it? What do these things do? And the more we can just readily point them towards, you know, the Filecoin examples of this world or the humanitarian aid things or what's happening in gaming, et cetera, all of that is just going to make uh, our job easier. I mean, at, at Coinbase, we are not necessarily solving for use cases, but we want to facilitate that in Web3. So you will have seen we launched Base uh, over the summer. We had on-chain summer. So we now have this layer two above Ethereum, this kind of scaling solution. And that's part of our philosophy which is we want to provide all of the tools and the infrastructure uh, as best we can for the developers, for people out there to go build stuff. Uh, and so rather than kind of building the end solution ourselves, we want to make sure that everybody can leverage our cloud, can leverage our wallet. We have a terrific wallet as a service product. We now have this base blockchain. And so I think you know, over the next years, what I want to see is as this regulation beds in, we have a real kind of push coming in our direction around use cases, which will make things easier. I think the final, my kind of final thing, which I think is a breakout use case in the financial kind of um, side of things is gonna be stable coins. Um, I was on a panel in Leeds at the weekend. I was lucky enough, I was sitting next to John Cunliffe, who's the deputy governor of the Bank of England. And he was talking about what the Bank of England is doing on uh, digital currency, on CBDC, at the digital pound. Uh, and look, that's kind of exciting, but what was clear to me is that's not going to come for a while, right? Whether that's two years or three years, I don't know. I don't think they've even decided definitively to do it or not. Um, but in the meantime, I think stable coins are going to get better and they're going to get faster and we're going to see kind of regulation for them. And, you know, I think it's now everybody understands that there's superior payments technology out there, right? I mean, when you see stable coins settling 11 trillion, five times more than PayPal, et cetera, um, you know, these things are going to, uh, I think, move very, very quickly. So we'll, you know, and there will also be a very difficult political conversation around the digital pound in terms of privacy and other things. So, so kind of I'm excited to see, you know, the regulation will come. I think we'll deal with it. It's kind of good. I think use cases as much as possible. And then I think to have this digitally native, like putting, you know, fiat currencies on supersonic rails, um, I think this is going to help fuel DeFi and, and, be, um, and be the way forward. Definitely. And this is not something that Coinbase... Uh, alone can achieve. I think it's more collectively the whole industry needs to push for the right direction, mm. which I think a lot of the initiatives are already going this way, which is really good. We do have some time, so maybe we'll do some Q and A's. We'll take some questions. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any. We have a, a few hands. Sorry, you probably need to raise your hand a bit more so we yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Do we have a mic here? Right. Thank you. Hi, th Hi, thank you for the talk till now. I'm a student studying at Imperial College London and I'm here representing the society. I was just wondering what your opinion on the spot Bitcoin ETF is and how you see it affecting the market in the long term. Spot Bitcoin yes, ETF. Yes, spot, did everyone hear that? Spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, look, I, I probably don't know a huge amount more than you do, uh, but if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, uh, the institutions behind those applications, I think it represents, I think I'm right, about 17 trillion of assets under management, including the world's biggest kind of asset manager. BlackRock, I don't think, has ever failed, right, in terms of, you know, one of these applications. So, look, I think our house view is this will happen. We think it's a matter of time. The SEC are continuing to push it back, but we're now seeing progress, right, on ETH futures, right, EDFs and stuff like that from the CFTC. So, whether it's in January or whether it's a little bit further out, we just think it's coming. We definitely think it's coming. And another theme, which maybe I should have touched on, is about access, right? Access, you know, on ramps into this. Um, and look, if you, you know, you could buy Coinbase stock, right? That gives you some exposure, but uh, you can get into the, the, you know, the asset class directly, or you can do it via an ETF. And if and when they are um, given the green light by the SEC, which I think again is a matter of time. That's going to, I think, open the door to uh, a huge amount of institutional money. Uh, yeah. And I think when that comes in, whether that's the start of the next bull cycle or not, I don't know. I don't have a kind of you know, uh, crystal ball here. 
but certainly that will be you know a big moment right yeah. that'll be a big big moment and just to add my two cents here I, because coinbase provides the custody service for majority of those if not all of those etf applications out there for bitcoin spot etfs um, and for, from, so from that aspect, I think the whole industry is ready in terms of infrastructure and everything. Yeah. It's just a matter of uh, the SEC's view on how institutions can access crypto. And uh, to be fair, for all of the applications out there, I know we've been uh, postponed again. It's about uh, earlier this week. Uh, SEC announced that they are going to delay the decision on all the Bitcoin spot ETFs out there. Uh, but I think, as you mentioned, we are getting there uh, step by step. I think it's just a matter of time and waiting. At the same time, though, myself, I feel very proud of this industry because we are collectively putting a lot of pressure on the right decisions and how things should move forward. So thanks for that question. I think we have time for one more. Thank you. So I've enjoyed this conversation so many hours. Um, I'm in the digital assets team at KPMG, and we do believe that stable coins is the is the technology that will bring the catalyst, I guess. We've seen a lot of market activity in the last few weeks, um, especially around PayPal. We think that's the, that will cause a domino effect. But another te technology we've seen is tokenization of financial instruments. You know, it brings liquidity, efficiency, interoperability. I think it's all right. Um, where do you see that in terms of adoption on the map? Do you see that as a, do you see that um, bringing uh, adoption for consumers and financial institutions. Yeah. So for the people at the back, the question is around uh, financial assets on chain, so real world asset on chain. But also, as you mentioned, uh, it's the stable coin that from PayPal is a, your view is going to be a catalyst of that. So I just wanted to repeat the question. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, look, I, maybe I can start with an anecdote, right? I, I was um, sitting down talking to the CEO of a big stock exchange and uh, in a kind of informal moment, he told me that there were 15 different parties that touched every transaction that basically went to the exchange from kind of, you know, from soup to nuts. That is a lot. And every single one of those intermediaries is taking a cut, right? They're taking a slice. Um, one of the exciting things about this technology, if you're a TradFi person, is that that, in, that entire post-trade market infrastructure, which has, you know, custodians and sub-custodians and CSDs and CCPs, et cetera, et cetera, do we need that if we've now got a bearer market? So we can take these assets and we can tokenize them. We can put them on these fast rails. It's effectively a bearer market and you can have atomic settlement. So do you need a central securities depository at that point? Uh, and do you need all of those things? And the best thing is you don't have to capitalize the settlement risk that you have and you don't have to wait two, three days. So there is an enormous potential for this technology to revolutionize kind of capital markets. And we can go from T plus two or T plus three down to T plus zero, right? So atomic settlement. But what I will say is that I think it's going to take time for us to get there, right? ASX and other stock exchanges around the world have already tried to look into this. And these are such big, such important markets that we've got to move, I think, in a phased and gradual way there. Everybody recognizes, I think, that the, the technology can, can kind of deliver. But there will also be incumbency. So one of the things in this room we have to deal with the whole time is that there is a, a way of doing things today. And whether you're a regulator or you're one of these intermediaries, like we're bringing a new way of doing stuff and a way of getting rid of these intermediaries, right? So we are going to face, and we do face, kind of opposition to that. So I think it's just a, a long way of saying, I think it's very exciting. I think it's on the roadmap. Um, I'm not sure it's going to happen immediately. Final point would be, you kind of started off with stable coins. And I actually think one of the massive use cases of stable coins is going to be as the kind of the fiat settlement in any RWA kind of like transactions. So when we put not just money, but we put financial assets and everything else on blockchain rails like when people are settling and they're trading they're going to want to settle into a digitally native asset so whether that's a you know a gbp stable coin or whether it's a us one or whatever probably a gbp here like that i think is going to be a breakout use case and that's really going to fuel adoption of of kind of stable coins in and amongst other things excellent very good insight thank you very much tom and thanks everyone for joining us today i hope you enjoy the conversation thank you.